Around the world, the spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to the Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write the Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 669, Alexis, North Carolina, 28006. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. This is Pastor David Langford. I'd like to welcome you tonight to this edition of the Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. We began a message last week entitled, The Age of Deception. Without any further ado, I want to take you back now into that anointed program where I'm preaching this message entitled, The Age of Deception. 627 says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. When you take your own life, that is self wrath inflicted on you and the sun goes down on you literally spiritually just a few days ago a pastor in atlanta between the two morning worship services went home blew his brains out why why i'll tell you one of the reasons one of the reasons is because the pressure is so adamant so ardent so unyielding on ministers to make concessions, they cannot endure the stress trying to please everyone, trying to make everyone happy. Let me tell you something, sir. Let me say something, ma'am. If you're pleasing men, you're displeasing God. If you are pleasing God, then you are displeasing men. That's right. I'd rather be popular with God and unpopular with men than to be popular with men and be unpopular with God Almighty. Jeremiah was a prophet. He told Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, before I formed you in your mother's belly, I knew you. Conception does not begin in a mother's womb. Conception begins in the mind of God. Don't let the devil tell you that lie. Conception begins in the womb. That's not true. Conception begins in the mind of God. He told Jeremiah, before I formed you in your mother's belly, I knew you. Before you came forth from your mother's loins, I ordained you a prophet unto the nations. Go on down to about verse 17 or so. He said, Jeremiah, do not be confounded by the people's faces. I have made you like a walled and defensed city. I have made you like a pillar of iron. He was telling Jeremiah, I'm your God. I'm your refuge. I am your resources. I'm everything that you will ever need. And if you obey me, no matter how adamantly they come against you, and by the way, in the next verse, he said, they will fight against you, Jeremiah, but they will not overcome you because I am with you, Jeremiah. You see, God knew that the people would reject the message from the messenger. And thus the messenger is commanded and embraced by God, reinforced by God, saying, yes, they are going to fight you, man of God, but I am with you. The New Testament equivalency of that is Romans 8, 31. If God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 37, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I know what it means for people, and especially religious people, to fight me. But I cannot water down the message of Christ. I cannot dilute, I cannot pollute the message of Christ. We must stand firm and we must preach repentance. Well, I know that's not popular. 
Jesus said, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. Some of my dear brothers say you can't fall from grace. Well, what did he say? What did he mean when he said, remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen? I can't fall off of the tailgate of the truck until I get up on it. I can't fall off of the ladder until I get up on it. And if I can get on something and fall off of it or fall away from it, I had to once be there. Remember, aggregate, collect your thoughts. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do what? The first works. What's the first works? Repentance. But we don't witness that anymore because that's an admission of guilt, an admission of sin in a person's life. Well, that's what the office of the Holy Ghost is for, to convince a man, to convict a man or convince a man, convict a man that he's lost and undone without God. That's what the Holy Ghost does to men. He assures them, you're lost, you're without God. Just the other day, someone sent me a email and there was a YouTube video attached to it. Wanted me to watch it. Well, I did not watch it. I don't want to watch it. But the subject was preachers of LA cannot find any Bible verses that say Shacking up is a sin. Now, I didn't watch the video clip. I, I, I will not watch it. I don't watch that kind of spiritual filth and trash. And that's what it is. You can say what you want to. There's nothing Holy Ghost godly and anointed about things of that nature. Nothing whatsoever. My point in bringing this up, I want to show you how shallow the preachers of L.A. are in all truth. They are so shallow, they are so anemic, that they make such statements, we cannot find anything in the Holy Writ that says shacking up is wrong. Well, I'm going to try to help those who right now, tonight, watching this program, or whenever that it might be, you're shacking up, you're living in sin, you are cohabitating, and you're not married. That is sin, and that'll take you to a devil's hell unless you repent of it and stop it in Jesus' name. Yes, I said every bit of that. You needed to hear that. You're sitting right there watching me right now. You're shacking up. Sir, ma'am, you know it's wrong. You're, you're defiling your body, which is the temple of the Lord, and you know that it's not right, but you're fulfilling the lust of the flesh. Well, let's back up and see if I can't give you some revelation, some word of God to help ameliorate the circumstance. Romans chapter 13, verse 11, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light, and let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envyings, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Now let's go back. Verse 11. And that knowing the time, it is a time and an age and era of great deception. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to, to awaken to what's going on around us. For our salvation is far more nearer than when we first believed. 
The night is far spent and the day is at hand. The day of the Lord is at hand. Let us walk honestly as in the day. Honesty prevails in the day. Backdoor deals, backdoor handshakes in the night. Drunkenness in the night, gambling in the night, prostitution in the night. All of this takes place under the auspices of darkness. John 3, 19, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness. Sir, drunkenness is a sin. Ma'am, drunkenness is a sin. It'll separate you from God Almighty unless you repent of it. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness. Chambering. The word chambering in the Greek literally means to shack up. Cohabitation. Uh, I, I can't say what I need to say here because, well, it's just so plain. It, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, it's having a type of intercourse, fornication, and some other words I cannot use on television. It's in the Greek. Look it up. Chambering and wantonness, desiring, coveting, lusting for the flesh. The word chambering simply literally means shacking up, cohabitating. Preachers of L.A., read your Bible. It's in there. But you're so shallow. You're so spiritually shallow, you don't read the Holy Writ. It's in the Word of God. He continued to say in verse 14, And make no provision for the flesh, to fulfill the lust thereof. What do you think people are doing when they're shacking up? They're fulfilling the lust of the flesh outside of holy matrimony, wedlock. If there's nothing wrong with shacking up, why did God institute and implement marriage? Why? Why does God in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 condemn fornication? That's too unmarried people, two single people committing an act of fornication. Why does God condemn that and say, I've told you in time past, I tell you again, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Look with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning at verse 9. It's all there. So they're making provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And then they have the audacity to try to repudiate the word of God and say things like, well, I don't see anything wrong or find anything in the scriptures that condemns shacking up. It's because you're deceived. Let me say it again. Watch me, listen to me closely. That's because you are deceived. Many shall come in my name saying I am Christ and shall deceive many. Sir, ma'am, every soul that goes to hell because you preach that heresy, you preach that mendacity, you preach that lie, that blood of that soul that died and went to a devil's hell will be on your hands. Preachers of LA, that blood will be on your hands. I had a vision once of preachers in hell tormented to no end, and I saw their hands. Their hands were covered in blood, and they were wringing their hands untiringly, endlessly, just trying to get the blood off, trying to get it off, but they couldn't get it off. I saw abortionist doctors who abort babies trying to get the blood off their hands, and they couldn't get it off. That'll be a torment for all eternity, sir. That'll be a torment at a torment for all eternity, ma'am, because you can't get that blood of a soul off your hands. That's the oldest trick in the Bible. Pilate, bring me the water, let me wash my hands. 
Why well, I, I know why I'm I'm certitude this is not popular and I'll get my share of hate mail. Oh, you're you're just too rigid. You're you that that's just too hard. Have I given you anything that wasn't in the Holy Writ? Have I not given you scripture for everything I've been preaching? Have I not given you thus saith the word of God? You see, you don't appreciate this book. I, I, I preached some weeks ago for a friend of mine, and I took a scripture text from Proverbs 25, verse 11. Words fitly spoken are like apples of gold and pitchers of silver. And I said, we've come to a point where we don't appreciate the written word. I said, we don't appreciate the written word of God, but it's valuable. It's holy and it's precious. And I'll tell you how precious the written word is. When Satan came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that this stone be made bread. And what was Christ's response? He quoted Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. He said, It is written. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Three times Jesus said emphatically, it is written, it is written, it is written. Folks, it is written in this book, whether you believe it or not. It is written. I had another lady just the other day wrote me a five-page letter. She rebuked me for calling marijuana wacky tobacco because she smokes dope. She claims she's a spirit-filled Christian. Rebuked me. Gave me Genesis 1, 29. Well, I, I know what it says. I have given thee every green herb for meat to eat. That, my friend, verse, where he said he gave every green herb for meat to eat was prior to the fall and the curse. So let's go eat cocoa leaves. The cocoa leaves, you know, cocaine. You, you see them down there in Central South America, pulling the leaves and eating them. They're getting high. That's every green herb, isn't it? Or... Tobacco, it's a green leaf. You can justify anything you want to justify. You, that's what they're doing. They're taking the scriptures and they're perverting them. They're twisting them. This is the age of deception. This is the age of people believing a lie and they're going to be damned, the Bible says. 2 Thessalonians 2.11, For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. Do you want to be damned? The way you're damned is by not believing the truth. That's how you're damned. They had pleasure in unrighteousness. I, I responded uh, to the lady in one of my programs, I said, oh, I can see Peter, James, and John just a few moments before the Holy Ghost came and cloven tongues like as a fire set upon each of them. And they said to one another, hey, dude, let's go out here and smoke a joint right quick before the Holy Ghost falls and we start speaking in tongues. Can, can you imagine, can you fathom that? That's what you call a lie out of hell. Can you imagine Peter, James, and John saying, man, let's go burn one right quick before the Holy Ghost falls. This, is, this sounds comical, doesn't it? But it's the truth. A five-page letter trying to convince me a Holy Ghost, spirit-filled preacher that I'm wrong for saying it's wacky tobacky. What, what are we coming to? What is taking place is beyond description. 
But Jesus said to his disciples, look with me, Matthew 24, 4. Take heed that no man deceive you. Let me tell you, preachers are taking souls by the tens of thousands to hell every day. One of the most prominent ministers in this nation said the other day, Allah and Jehovah is the same God. That's a lie straight out of hell. There's not but one Jehovah. Oh, I know there are many ways to get to heaven. Grasshopper. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? There's only one way. Jesus did not say in John 14, 6, I am one of the ways. I am one of the truths. I am one of the lives. He said emphatically, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. You can't bypass Jesus, go to Allah, and get to Jehovah God the Father. It don't work. And I know people don't appreciate this truth. Oh, they'll send tens of thousands and tens of millions of dollars to keep the charlatans on the air, but let somebody preach the truth, and, well, we, don't, we can't afford to support that. Doesn't bother me. I've said all along. We're only here as long as God wills us to be here. But while we are here, we will preach the truth of God's word no matter what people say or do. My heart is grief stricken. My heart is smote, smitten by conviction that we're allowing, we're tolerating this type of, it's not preaching. I don't know what it is. I told a minister friend of mine today, he was talking about this particular mega church, said, oh, the music is absolutely unbelievable. I said, they want entertainment, not worship. My God, Moses didn't have no great big orchestra or band on the backside of the desert, but he had a burning bush. Hallelujah. He had a burning bush. Jehovah showed up and he said, Moses, take off your shoes for where you're standing is holy ground, man of God. That's worship. I heard some young lady some time ago, I, I, com I commended her. I said, you did, a, you, you did a great job on your song this morning, your soundtrack. Your song was wonderful. She said, oh, I didn't think it was such a good performance. I regretted complimenting her because I didn't know she was performing. I thought she was ministering to the Lord and magnifying him, but she let me know my performance, well, it was just not up to what I thought it should be. When did we start performing for God? That's because that's entertainment. She's performing to entertain the congregation, but that's not worship. No. We're becoming more and more divided every day, spiritually and politically. If we don't pray and seek God and cry out to God, there will be a, a, another grave travesty in this nation within the next two years. Mark my words. Do I rejoice in saying that? Absolutely not. Every, every time we have a tragedy, it, it, souls go out into eternity to meet God lost. We're, listen, somebody was arguing with me the other day and they said, I was making the, the connotation, the implication, we're, we're far off worse now than we were in the Great Depression. They scolded me, rebuked me for saying that. I said, no, we're not. I said, what you don't understand in the Great Depression, we didn't have food stamps all these welfare programs, subsidized housing, uh, unemployment checks. That's why you had shanty towns, people living in cardboard boxes. You saw soup lines. You'd have soup lines, so many of them right now, you couldn't feed the people if they weren't giving them free money to go buy groceries. And yet politicians have the audacity to say, this stimulates the economy people who don't have a job, people who don't have an income, you give them money, that stimulates the economy. 
This is the age of deception. You're hearing it. Remember the famous words, we have to pass it to see what's in it? That, 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 that is absurd to say the least. But it's taking place in your face. I said it's taking place in your face. And if we don't repent and get a hold of God Almighty and turn from our wicked ways, only God Almighty knows the gravity of where we'll be in the next several years. I want to take a moment to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now for that man, that woman, that boy, that girl that is sitting here watching this broadcast tonight. Lord, they're under conviction and they have an unction from the Holy Ghost to repent. They are constrained, they are compelled by the Holy Ghost of God to repent of their sins. Lord, and I want to thank you right now I want to thank you right now for leading these souls to repentance. I thank you that you have washed away their sins. As they have sat there, they have wept, they have cried, they have, they've had true godly sorrow and repentance for their sins. Thank you, Lord, for touching their hearts. Thank you, Father, for reaching down into the horrible pit and the miry clay and bringing them out of that chaos and that destruction. Bless them, redeem them, and seal them by your Holy Spirit, Father. We ask it tonight, in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. I pray that you have given your heart to Jesus this night. Write me, tell me, write me please at The Voice of Evangelism. Post Office Box 669, Alexis, North Carolina, 28006. Want my producer to put on the screen our mailing address, The Voice of Evangelism. Post Office Box 669, Alexis, that's A-L-E-X-I-S, North Carolina, 28006. If you're being ministered to by this television programming, let us know. Let us know, and if you are, stand with us, help us. God will bless that that you sow into the kingdom of the Most High God. God bless you. We'll see you again at this same time next week in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism, P.O. Box 669, Alexis, North Carolina, 28006. That's P.O. Box 669, Alexis, North Carolina, 28006.